All right, Dick, let's start with a personal question. Yeah. You're the director of a large synthetic biology research center. Yeah. You have to balance a lot of pressures and a lot of commitments. Mm -hmm. You have to publish great work. You have to do fundraising. Yeah. You're under pressure to commercialize the research and the technologies that are being developed here. How do you see the role of ethics within your center? Okay, so the role of ethics. I mean, scientists are people too. So we all bring up children, pay our taxes, uh, elect governments, we have responsibilities because of those things. And in some ways, like all people, we're stewards of the planet we live in. So we, we have to think deeply about what we're doing. Um, most scientists I meet are deep thinking people, thoughtful people who do think about ethical issues of their research. Of course, first and foremost, they're curiosity driven, interested in understanding the world we live in, but they also think deeply about it. The vast majority of Blue Skies research, fundamental research that's done, will not change the world. It will just change our appreciation and understanding of it. And I think that's a really important point, and it's a really important um, thing to protect, right? But an example of basic research that is about to change the world is something called CRISPR-Cas9. Now, forget the technical jargon, that just refers to, it's an acronym actually, for something that happens in bacteria. Uh, and the second part, the Cas9, is a protein that allows this to happen. Right? But it turns out that this observation in biology, which has now been turned into a technology, allows us to edit genomes. That means that in principle, we have the ability to snip out faulty genes that might lead to disease and replace them with faultless genes that do the normal job in undiseased people. I think that's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly interesting. It also throws up lots of ethical issues and therefore it gets us to think about responsible research and innovation, right? So we can do this now. The question is, should we do it? And I think that's, that's the real question. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And we should, we should have that debate about it. Do we run a risk that this principle of responsible research and innovation, which seems like a very good idea, starts to intervene and starts to interfere with fundamental research, with basic research, in a way inadvertently, by demanding that all research, in a sense, be oriented towards desirable social goals or desirable social, social aims? First of all, I'm a basic scientist, right? But it just so happens that some of the work that we do may have potential for applications. For example, we're trying to develop um, things that might lead to new vaccine platforms. And one of the targets that we're going after is dengue, which is related to Zika. That seems like a sensible, good thing to do. But it comes, it's founded on basic research. And the thing about basic research, fundamental research, it is by definition blue skies. It is by definition research. We don't know what's gonna come out of it. When we started working on this work that will maybe lead to this vaccine platform, we weren't, in, we weren't interested at all in developing new vaccines. We were interested in developing uh, molecules that would self-assemble and that we could control and we didn't know what kind of applications they might have. It was just our curiosity about how biological molecules work and how, they, how they're put together and whether we can mimic that, whether we can understand it. And my personal view is that the, the vast, vast, overwhelming majority of this stuff is good, solid science that should be done and it is of no risk to us or the planet, right? You can't write a grant or, write or publish a paper which has got risky procedures in it, right? Because, or if you do, the referees of that grant and the paper are obliged to tell the grant giving bodies and the editors of the journal that there's risky stuff going on here. So then comes that translation into more applied areas. And again, I would say the vast majority of applied pieces of science are done by good people with good intentions for good reasons, right? So we try and, I've just talked about vaccine development, others are trying to build drugs that will help cure people or treat disease, right? So regulation, I mean, and the interve intervention of government uh, in the scientific progress, uh, in pr process. There's plenty of that. I'm not saying everything is covered, particularly in, in terms of synthetic biology, where people are talking about creating new organisms. So 
that can't necessarily be regulated at the moment, right? But there is a lot of re regulation. So you need home office licenses to work on vertebrates. Um, we can't work on humans. Um, and um, you, there's a whole load of safety checks and regulations about working on bacteria so we don't get accidental re release and that kind of stuff. So there's plenty of regulation. As I say, may not be that everything is covered in synthetic biology, but it's pretty good at the moment. It seems like biotechnology is becoming more and more present uh, in our society. So do you think that researchers and biotechnologists then have a special role to play in terms of intervening in, being active in ethical and political debates around the kinds of technologies they're developing? That's interesting. So I think the answer is yes and no. So yes, as informed people, we ought to take an active role in doing this, right? But should our arguments, our thoughts carry more weight? I'm, I'm not sure. We are in a position to advise on science and technology and we should be definitely doing that. We can add to that informed debate. But you don't think the opinions of researchers or of scientists as experts carry greater weight or carry more weight than the opinion or the position of any other citizen? I think the opinions per se, no, because we've, we've all got those and they should all be treated equally. But I think what we're talking about here is uh, the knowledge, the understanding of the technology and the science behind it. And I think it's a really important role of scientists, or some scientists, to get that across. So to help inform that debate. Whether our opinion should carry more weight because of that, that's a tricky one, isn't it? I, th I think we should be listened to because we understand the science behind the technology and where the technology might go. I think a lot of uh, this, the development of what we're calling responsible research and innovation is precisely about that, it's about listening. So it's about scientists being listened to, but also scientists listening to the wider debate and to concerns that are arising from that, from that yeah. debate. Yeah. I agree, and this is in synthetic biology a number of years ago, and I guess we might brush on this as well. Um, we had the dialogue with the general public, or general publics, about what they thought of synthetic biology and what the consequences for health and food and so on might be. And I think that, that two-way process is incredibly important, but it's important that it's informed. Um, as well as just a free-for-all debate. We, we need to garner all those opinions, but we also need to do it in an informed framework. I'm fully up for public engagement in science, and that being a two-way process, but it's quite difficult to talk about uh, non-specialists telling scientists what to do, right? First of all, we have this thing called the Haldane Principle, which, which encourages government to fund science but leave the science, the process of science, to the scientists. Um, now I think that's good and it's worked pretty well for decades, right? Um, I can understand the tensions and the difficulties that people have now that we've got this power in synthetic biology, which we haven't really discussed, but it's this idea that we really can chop and change with pieces of DNA and move pieces of DNA genes around from one organism to another. We can, inter we, we can intervene um, with DNA and reconstruct it in a very incredibly precise way. And this, after, the, after all, is the stuff that um, makes the whole of biology. It encodes the whole of biology. So that's a pretty powerful technology to have at your hands. So I agree that we have to have this process, but I'm very nervous about intervening in basic science that will eventually lead to these technologies that we should think about intervening in with. The synthetic biology dialogue, which was yeah. conducted by the BBSRC, so the, one of the United Kingdom's research funding bodies. Yeah. One of the things that we sort of expected to find in that dialogue yeah. was this concern about synthetic biologists playing God and disrupting the natural order. In fact, we didn't really find that. No, we didn't find that at all. Which yeah. was really interesting. Yeah. We find that in the dialogue, which was really interesting. So it's this concern about the relation between government, research, and industry. Yeah. And a concern that the government, using public money, is funding research that will then be commercialized, and the gain from that commercialization mm -hmm. might not necessarily be, let's say, returned to the public. So that's the sort of, that's the general framework of the concern. How do we get the balance right between 
commercial partnerships and commercial interests. So the, th the thing that's really encouraging for me in this whole sphere is how we've been encouraged to work with industry. So we're seeing more genuine partnerships. So not on the vaccines project, but on another project that is not too distantly related. Um, we are working with a big pharma company to try and improve their chemical processes for producing drugs. And that is a fantastically rewarding um, collaboration between, between the services. It's very much an academic collaboration, but if it comes off, we help improve their processes, which should hopefully speed up the, uh, um, the pace of producing new drugs and make them cheaper, not just for, for the company, but hopefully in the market as well. And I, and I think the more partnerships like we have like that, maybe the more trust that the outside will have in, 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 what, in what we're trying to do. It's not just us and them, it's not just the academic scientists and the industrial money-minded scientists. Other examples where technologies are developed uh, and a lot of that money's already been spent, how do we more philanthropically roll it out? Great example of this is the Bill and Melinda Gates polio vaccine program. You know, we don't have polio in all but two countries on the planet now. That's pretty impressive, right? So they're working very hard on those two other countries, I'm sure, right? But this is one way we can roll out things that have been produced uh, in academic and commercial settings to do good across the planet globally. The concerns that might be raised about something like that are, okay, yes, of course it's better that children are vaccinated than not vaccinated, yeah. but who has control ultimately over these, over these procedures? So I have a slight difficulty with this, right? Because if somebody doesn't take control, right, we will not have drugs because it, it, as I've already said, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of investment in money and people to deliver these things. Not just to produce them and make money, but make sure they're safe, for one thing, right? So somebody has to take control of those things. And, and, it, and okay, at the moment it's Big Pharma. Philanthropist who made his money out of commercialising things, takes control in a worldwide programme as only he can because he's got the resource to do it. And let's be honest about it, the, the will and the energy to do it rolls out the polio vaccine program. I think those are both good things, right? The extreme that you seem to be suggesting that is being talked about there almost sounds utopian to me, almost sounds Star Trek, right? Let's do away with that money. Let's do away with money. Let's, do away, let, let's just collect everything together for the common good, right? I, it's not realistic at the moment in the world. And if we want to deliver these things for the good of humankind, then we're going to have to work in partnerships with um, industry, academe, philanthropists, charities to make it happen. I just think that's the reality of the situation. From your perspective as a scientist, mm. is there a sort of uh, fundamental shift that's occurring? Or is it, you talked about the yes. molecular biology revolution and how this is a continuation of, the, of that. Mm. Are we looking at a radical shift or do you think it's just step-by-step -step progress and change? So I think if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said no, step change, no radical changes. Um, because of course we've been domesticating cats and dogs for millennia and um, we'll carry on doing those sorts of things, right? Using traditional Mendelian genetics and ways of manipulating or crossing organisms. And same with crops, right? The difference is now that we can do this with molecular precision at the gene level. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, diff, that's a big difference. The step change that's happened over the last couple of years is this, gene, this ability to gene, edit genomes much, much more precisely. Okay? So rather than taking one gene for growth hormone from a human and putting that into a bacteria and to produce that protein, but now we can take a whole genome and we can snip it and cut and paste it as we like. It is different technology and that is a step, that is a step change. So I, th I would think until a couple of years ago, there were gradual changes since, since the 70s, right? Um, but now there's a, another step change. A big step change, you want to say? I think a, so, a, yeah, a, yeah. a major step. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when you start talking about the creation of synthetic genomes and this, you know, cutting and, cutting and pasting within, yeah. it, within a genome, a lot of people's eyebrows are going to go up and they're going to say, 
this is some sort of violation of nature or a violation of the, of the natural order. And as a scientist, how do you think about nature? Do you think about nature as something inherently valuable and value-laden? Or do you think about it just as a resource for us to, to cut and to paste and to do with, do with it as, we, as benefits us best? I think, I think it is a natural evolution of things from um, rearing cats and dogs through an understanding of Mendelian genetics onto molecular biology. But I think there are punctuations in our understanding that lead to these step changes. That's, that's, the, that's the first thing. Um, in terms of um, natural order, I'm not sure what that means to me, right? Nature, life, biology, incredibly complex, right? And we get these things that are called emergent properties. And I don't know if that's what you mean by natural order, but that's what a scientist might mean, right? It, it seems much greater than the sum of its parts, right? That's another way of saying it's complex and we don't understand it. We don't have to invoke a higher being that brought this together, in my view, to, under, to understand it or just explain it away, right? I still think there's something precious there. I still think there's a lot we don't understand, but it's also something to stand back and in awe and wonder and think, wow, isn't this, isn't, isn't this amazing? Even though, as a molecular scientist, I can start thinking about understanding it in terms of atoms and molecules, doesn't mean I'm in, in any less in awe of it or in wonder at it. I think it's amazing. Right? And I do think we go in there at our peril in some ways if we start engineering with it, playing with it, without a complete understanding. So my personal brand of synthetic biology, to bring it fully round to me, is I try and uh, engineer from a perspective of understanding at the molecular level. I do feel some nervousness about this ability to engineer and do synthetic biology at the organismal level, even though it, we have the ability to do it. Right? Because I think the consequences of, of it, because we don't understand the complexity, might be far greater than we'd imagined. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, just means we have to really tread carefully.